I heard this uh, Father's Day joke, and it goes like this. <laughs> One dad said to another dad that Father's Day is the only time his kids are obedient to him. When he tells them he doesn't want them to spend much money on him, they obey. <laughs> they obey. Um, me, myself, I'm pretty simple, actually. I like steak, a movie, I'm good. Back rub, walk in the park. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a diva on Father's Day. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I don't want to do anything. So, um, but uh, we're gonna be looking at obedience today from one of the parables of Jesus as we continue in our Parables of Jesus series. Um, you know, obedience, it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, it really is because a person can obey and that obedience um, comes from the love they have for you, right? That's, that's, that's obedience. That's the type of obedience we like. That's the type of obedience we would, we would want our children to have. Obedience that comes from a place of love. <clears throat> uh, but there's also another type of obedience that doesn't have love. It doesn't come from a place of love. It comes from a place of, I just want to obey you so I can get the rewards or whatever it is that I'm after. Now, this, is what we, this type of obedience is what we saw in the book of Malachi. Uh, the people didn't love God, they, they only loved his blessings, and that's why they would be obedient to him. Then there are those who say they are going to obey, but it's only lip service, because they don't obey and never had any intentions to ever obey. Christian author and researcher and pastor, Ed Stetzer, he wrote an article titled, Too Many So-Called Christians Merely Giving Lip Service to Jesus. He said roughly three out of four Americans identify as Christians and that those self-identified Christians fall into three groups. Number one, cultural Christians. These are the people who believe they are Christians because the culture tells them they are. They are Christians in name only and don't practice a vibrant faith. Number two, there was congregational Christians. Although these Christians are similar to the first group, they have at least some connection to congregational life. They may even have a church they consider to be a church home that they attend occasionally, but they don't have a real vibrant faith either. And then the third group is convictional Christians. This final group is made up of those who actually live according to what they profess. They have a personal relationship with Jesus that has led to life change. So here's his thesis. He says, my personal feeling is that this last group, this is the convictional Christians, consists of well less than 25% of the population in the U.S. Probably something more like 10% or even less. And I would agree with him. Many of us have heard of the famous parable, the prodigal son. But Jesus gives us another parable about two sons, and it doesn't get as much attention as the prodigal son does. But it's very important for Christians and non-Christians. It's called the parable of the two sons. And we will see that today through this parable that God is pleased with that third group we just read about. True repentance is what he's after and not performance. True repentance over piety. So let us read Matthew 21 verses 28 to 32. The parable of the two sons. What do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. 
For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these parables um, that teach spiritual truths. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand this parable, that we cannot just apply it to the religious people of, of the day, uh, the chief priests and Pharisees and scribes, but that we would be able to look at our own lives and apply this parable to ourselves, where we can look at our obedience uh, this morning. So Father, be with us, and may your will be done um, this morning in our lives. Let's call this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we dive into this parable, well, let's just discuss parables. What are they? So a parable, para, para, that means alongside. Balo means to throw or to hurl. So a parable is a story that comes alongside Jesus' teachings. It's a short moral story presented with imagery and metaphors to give truth. An example in the Old Testament would be Nathan comparing a poor man's only lamb being stolen by a rich man who had plenty as a metaphor for David's sin against Bathsheba and her husband. Jesus, he added parables to his teaching, and we see parables all through the Gospels. Now, why did Jesus use parables? Well, if you could turn with me to Matthew 13, Matthew 13, I want us to read verses 10 through 12. Matthew 13, 10 through 12 says this. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them to you. It has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given for to the one who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away. Even what he has will be taken away. What, what does that mean? Some believe that after Matthew 12, Jesus exclusively only taught in parables. And so you have to ask yourself, why? Why would he why would he do that? Well, the Pharisees and the leaders, they saw Jesus uh, cast out demons. They saw him heal people. Um, they saw his teachings and how they his teaching came with supernatural authority. Uh, there was no denying that. So they saw all of these things with their own eyes. And instead of glorifying God and repenting, they actually say that Jesus is a servant of Satan. Matthew 12, 24 says this, them speaking, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Like, that's crazy. What they're saying is that Jesus is in cahoots with Satan. It is from this moment that it appears that Jesus made a decision that the people would only get spiritual truth through parables. So not plain truth anymore, but parables. They see and hear and do not believe. And so out of that situation, we get our parable today, which points back to true repentance and obedience because of the things that you've seen and heard. Now, if you can go back to Matthew 21, Go back to Matthew 21. We see a lot of things happening in this chapter. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on a donkey. They're screaming Hosanna. And he gets to the temple and he has to flip over some tables because the house of the Lord has become a, a, a den for robbers. Next, Jesus, he curses a fig tree. Why? Because the fig tree, it had no fruit, but only leaves. The fig tree represented God's people. Israel and Jesus was rebuking Israel and their spiritual leaders for their spiritual blindness and lack of repentance. Then after all of that, the religious leaders, they asked Jesus where his authority comes from because they want him to say something that would justify them killing him. Jesus, he knew he was going to die. He, he came to die, but he was going to die on his father's time, not theirs. So Jesus, the master teacher, 
He turns their question on them and he asks them if the baptism of John the Baptist was from heaven or was it from man? They couldn't answer this because if they said heaven, then they would have to admit that their war against John and Jesus is actually a war against God. Because John confessed Jesus as Christ, the Messiah. Also, they couldn't say that John's ministry was from man because the people loved John and they believed he was sent by God. But get this, even in this moment, I want you to see the mercy and grace of Jesus. Even in this moment, Jesus was giving them another chance to repent. They could have been honest and, and, and said how they felt about Jesus, how they were fighting against the, all of the proof that they saw in John's ministry and what they're seeing Jesus do. But instead, Matthew 21, 27, they say, we do not know. And so Jesus responds to them, neither would I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then we get this parable. A man tells his two sons to go work in the man's vineyard, the first son says no, but then he changes his mind. He goes and he works in his father's vineyard. The second son says yes, but actually doesn't go and work in the vineyard. So Jesus asks, which of the sons did the will of the father? The religious leaders answer and they say the first son because he actually went and did the work. And then Jesus explains the parable. The first son represents the prostitutes and tax collectors that heard the word preached by John and believed and obeyed with true repentance. The second son, with his lip service to the father, represents the religious leaders who do not believe but walk and talk the religious talk. These religious leaders, uh, Pharisees and chief priests, they give off this image that they study the word they are religious as they come. They give off this impression that they're, they live these sold out lives to God. And Jesus, he confirms that John was more than a prophet, that John was the prophet Malachi prophesied about in Malachi 3.1, which says, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before you. Jesus even said in Luke 7, verse 28, I tell you, among those born of woman, none is greater than than John. John was a righteous man who came to show the way of righteousness. And sinners like the prostitutes and tax collectors were humbling themselves and showing signs of repentance because of John's teaching. Yet the religious people, the ones who should have known the prophecies, rejected John the Baptist. They rejected John, even though they were seeing with their own eyes sinners repenting of their sins. Now, why did they reject John? One of the reasons is pride. We often see in the gospel stories that the gospel stopped to show us the hearts of the Pharisees and that they were very jealous of the attention that Jesus was getting from the people. And also the same thing with John. They were prideful and jealous of John's ministry. The religious leaders, they should have been happy that people were turning from sin to God. They should have been rejoicing about that, seeing the miracles of Jesus, but instead they are prideful and jealous and looking for ways to kill Jesus. Yet the tax collectors and the prostitutes, now they believed. Those who were considered traitors and the worst of sinners, prostitutes, they're, 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 they're fornicators and tax collectors are called Roman sympathizers because they, they overtaxed Jewish people when they, they took property and all types of financial crimes against the Jewish people. When we look at Matthew 21, verse 31, Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. How can that be? The educated religious leaders who know how to speak, who, who know how to study the word, are being passed into the kingdom by the outcast and the most wicked of the day. And I also, again, want you to notice the grace and mercy of Jesus, even here. Jesus didn't say the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God and you can't go. He says they go before you, meaning there's still a chance for you. But if this is a race, you're being beaten by those who shouldn't be beating you. You know the scriptures. So you say you see the miracles. Why are you still rejecting Jesus? You see, Jesus, he he didn't get along. He got along with sinners. He even made Matthew, uh, who was a tax collector, an apostle. We we had one of the gospels is written by um, a tax collector, if you will. 
It was the religious people that Jesus had a problem with. They lacked mercy. They added to the law and they rejected the supernatural at times. In Mark chapter two, verse 16, it says, and the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. See, the beauty of what Jesus was saying there is that everyone needs the great physician. But some don't think they need to be saved. Some don't think they are sinners like the religious leaders. You know, often I listen to people and the way they talk about salvation and is as if they believe that Jesus uh, saved some people from swamps and he saved some people from nice swimming pools. And here's what I mean. Um, for some people, Jesus pulled them out of dirty, smelly swamps, right? Think of something you saw on a history channel in Louisiana or something, right? These dirty swamps. And Jesus comes in and he rescues that person from that, right? And then there are other people. Well, Jesus rescued them from a pool that, yeah, it needed some chlorine, but the water was still blue enough to see through it, right? You, you get what I'm saying? It wasn't that bad. I, I, my life wasn't really that bad. I, I was raised in a Christian home. And here's the truth. It doesn't matter where Jesus found you. You were dead in your sins. You were headed to hell because even your good works are filthy rags when held up to the holiness and righteousness of God. We all needed the great physician, Jesus Christ, to save us by dying for our sins so we could be forgiven. And I see the difference when I'm with Christians who understand they need a savior. They have no pride. They love the word. They love the church. They're willing to serve and they want others to know Jesus. Others, they're law keepers and they struggle with pride. And so how does this parable relate to us today? Well, I'm going to say it relates in many ways. For some, maybe some of you today, you, you've heard the stories. You've you've sat through years of preaching. Uh, you've heard the gospel. You may you may have even teared up a little bit uh, when you heard about the goodness of God and what he did in somebody else's life. Uh, you've seen the goodness of God as you watched other Christians call out to God in prayer and God responded with answer prayer. You've seen it. And instead of humbling yourself and repenting of your sins and turning from the world to Jesus, you instead, like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, reject Jesus. Or you say the answered prayer was a coincidence. Or you say you need more proof it was Jesus. Or you chop it up to maybe it was nature or something. And it's amazing how so many people, you know, they deny the existence of God, but they believe in Mother Nature, right? They believe in good and bad energy, but they, they reject God. Or some people, they say, I don't do religion or everybody has their own thing that brings peace. And, and like the religious leaders of Jesus day, pride is keeping you from coming to Jesus fully. And you think you can keep getting by with God just by lip service, coming to church or saying the right things. Right. And you're always seeking. You're always seeking out some new truth. Always on YouTube. Right. Never coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as creator, God, Lord and Savior. And you're going to wake up one day and you're going to see that you didn't wake up because you died in your sins and salvation and relationship with God that was offered to you multiple times is no longer there for you. Another way this applies to us today is that some of you, you've had or you have a John the Baptist in your life. You've had a John the Baptist type of person in your life, someone that keeps calling you and, and calling you to turn to Jesus, to stop giving him lift service and come to him in full obedience. But like the religious leaders, you reject that John the Baptist type of person in your life. Maybe you even start to hate that person and you miss that that person like John was a gift from God to you. One of the ways that God has been speaking to you for years is through that John the Baptist type person in your life and you reject him. Another way this applies to us today is some are so religious, man, they know it all. Yet 
You don't show the love of Christ. You look down on others. There's no gospel witness, no real relationship with people at the church. And so, yes, you can win a Bible argument, but nowhere to be found when a burden needs to be carried. And sometimes you fight so much, you often fight against God and what he's trying to do in your life. And you can't see it because you're blinded by anger and pride and comfort. And comfort's a big one. Uh, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were very comfortable. They, they liked things how they were. They liked sinners over here and they liked uh, 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 religious people over here. But what Jesus did, he comes in, he starts just knocking down walls and he makes things very uncomfortable. He says in Matthew 15, verse 8 through 9, he says, This people... They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You know, the scariest passage in the Bible, at least for me, is that passage where there's a lot of religious people, you know, together. And they're being told by Jesus to depart because he never knew them. That's, that's the scariest thing for me. Right. Because this isn't a movie. He is not after performers. You know, Jesus wants your hearts. He wants a real relationship. And he can't be bought off with good works. The Holy Spirit doesn't enter your life just to change the way you dress, get you to memorize some verses, and allow you to walk in this critical spirit of everyone who doesn't talk, think, and act like you do. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. That's not... The new life in Christ. The new life is in Christ is when the spirit enters and your heart is softened and we respond to God in worship and obedience and we seek his will. And, and as we see in verse 28, we want to work in the vineyard of the Lord. I love Galatians 2.20. It says, I've been cru crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so what that, that pastor says to me is that we are now on God's schedule after we have the Holy Spirit in us. We are now living to make him famous. And so we obey him in all things, even when we don't understand. Now, I want to give you one more way this pastor is speaking to some today. Some of you may have said no to Jesus. And maybe you feel like you are too far gone. But if you see like the first son who who said no and then he obeyed, Jesus is always willing to forgive and receive you into his love. Same thing if you're a Christian, maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe God has told you to do something for him. Maybe God has told you to walk away from something. Maybe God has called you to build something. I know he's called you to do something. And in fear, you've said no. And Jesus says in Luke six forty six, and this is why we read this during the scripture reading. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? He goes on to say those who do obey are like a man who built his house on a rock, a firm foundation. So when the storm comes, the house doesn't move. Jesus is a firm foundation, and we can trust him with our lives. We can obey him. And if you love him, well, we follow his commandments. We let him lead, and that is wisdom. That is wisdom. Are y'all keeping up with me? <laughs> when you guys get quiet, I just say, oh, they're just really into it. <laughs> However this parable speaks to you, um, I want you to get this. Don't be like the religious leaders and do nothing. This is a warning to anyone who is disobedient and offering only lip service to God. It's also a call to obedience over piety, right? We can't fool the reader of hearts. There's no suit. There's no good work that you can do to fool God. He knows who you are. This is a call to true repentance. When Jesus was asked by the father to work in the vineyard to come to earth, Jesus said yes. He didn't offer lip service to the father. And he could truly say, as he did say, I always do the will of my father. This is what Jesus said. He came and he died for his enemies. And we need to be like Jesus with our lives, even if he calls us to give up our lives. We want to be obedient to him. This is a call for anyone who, again, you've heard the gospel numerous of times. And yet still you haven't responded. 
but you just give a, a tip your hat to God, if you will, or give him a wink or a thumbs up. The time is now to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand and tomorrow is not promised. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that this parable here that we don't hear about it a lot, but um, there's so much deep truth in it. If we um, if we listen to our listen to your word and um, remove our pride, we will see that in each of us, uh, whether Christian or non-Christian, you are speaking to both. Father, I thank you that for your people, you care so much about us that you will not leave us in disobedience. In fact, uh, when you do punish us, it is because you love us. It is because you are a good father. And what good father um, does not punish their children in order to grow them in the right way that they should go? So, Father, I thank you for that. And I pray that you would convict us um, as we sit back and reflect on our lives, maybe this afternoon, of the times that we've said yes to you and we didn't go. Um, that you would forgive us and you would give us the grace uh, and the mercy um, and the power through your Holy Spirit to turn from the world, to turn from the grips of comfort um, and to turn to you. And though it may look scary and we don't understand what's going on, that we be reminded that you are a firm foundation. Father, I pray for those here who have heard your word they know the gospel. They can, they, can, they can quote it better than me. And yet they still are clinging to the world. Father, I pray for them. That their eyes will be open before it's too late. That they would see that you have so much more for them than the world can offer. And they would give all of themselves to you. You can be trusted with all of our lives. Every bit of it because you are powerful, um, because you are what we are seeking. Um, and so, Father, I just pray for them during this time that you would open their eyes and the veil would be removed that Satan has placed on their eyes um, that they could see your glory. If anyone here who would like to do that today, Father, I pray that they would speak to us after, or they can do it right now, that they would repent of their sins. And you've made it so simple for us that we, if we repent of our sins and turn to you, agree that we are sinners, I ask you to be our Lord and Savior, believing that you died on the cross and you rose three, day late, three days later, which signified that our sins have been paid fully. Your word says that we will be saved and that the Holy Spirit comes to live in our life and you start to change us. Um, you start to lead us in different directions. Um, but most importantly, we have a relationship with you. And second, the wrath that was upon us is, is removed. Um, and we enter your kingdom and we become your children. Father, I just pray that that would happen today, that that would happen to someone. Um, if not even here at, at another church, Father, I just want others to come to know you in this community. Father, help us to be agents of that, to help with that, and not to get in the way of anyone coming to you. Let's call this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.